In the summer of 1978, the Labour leader, Jim Callaghan, had to make one decision that all Prime Ministers are judged by, when to hold the general election. He called me into the study and uh, he said, I've decided on the date of the general election. And he took his pocket diary out and he looked at it and said, it wouldn't be proper for me to tell you, but he said, I've decided when we're going to have a general election. And this, this was with the 1978 diary in his hand. And he said, and I want you to start putting in place uh, preparations for it, which of course I did. Tom McNally wasn't the only one making plans. The trade unions were fed up after three years of incomes policy. Their members wanted the freedom to bargain for bigger wage increases. They had warned the Prime Minister that a difficult winter of pay claims lay ahead and had urged him to go for a quick election. It wasn't just the trade unions who were astonished. Labour had lost its majority in Parliament and pay pressures on the economy were building up like water behind a dam. The government knew that to win an election the following year, they had to continue their successful fight against inflation. That meant holding down the pay rises workers were demanding to 5%. But after three years of wage restraint, even 5% was anathema to the unions. It was not a pretty prospect the winter ahead. And the only question is, would it be chaos? Would it be industrial revolution? Would it be a breakup of the economy? Well, the economic ministers took the view, I think they were entitled to take the view, that we would get away with it. So once Dennis Healy had said that forcibly to the cabinet, with a few sighs of uh, apprehension, it was accepted without very much trouble. The first big test came with the pay negotiations at Ford. Everyone knew that the figure they settled on there would be treated as a marker by both unions and management, public and private alike. The trouble was, Ford had done well that year. A £258 million profit for shareholders and an 80% rise for the managing director. Keeping the workers to 5% wasn't going to be easy. On September the 21st, only a couple of weeks after Callaghan's fateful decision not to call an election, union leaders made their way down an uninviting alleyway in West London to hear the company's offer. If the union negotiators needed any reminder that 5% wouldn't wash, militant demonstrators were there to tell them. Well, in those days, the lobby was made up of, of hundreds of uh, Ford workers from different parts of the country with union banners and placards and the general slogan for £20 on the pay and one hour off the day. Don't forget the line workers! We want it now! The workers wanted 30%. Inside, management offered five. Right at the beginning, I, I made a comment that we were negotiating in a framework of incomes policy. And I saw people on the other side sort of cringe, but they, they didn't interrupt. Well, we told him that we weren't prepared to accept uh, such a derisory offer, and we certainly weren't prepared to accept the company hiding behind the shield of the government's uh, policy. It wasn't on a statute book. Uh, it was just a recommended policy of the government. And we demanded that you negotiate in a free collective bargaining atmosphere. And uh, he declined and said, I'm sorry, we can't do that. What happened basically was then conveners uh, started going on the phones and phoning back to their plants. Before you knew where you was, you started having the walkout. As the news came through, Ford workers across the country gave their verdict on the offer. Well, five percent no good to nobody, is it? And I remember quite vividly, uh, I worked in the foundry, and when people got the company leaflet, company always produced a leaflet um, to explain their offer. Hundreds and hundreds of men uh, just tearing up the leaflets and burning them and then everyone walking out in disgust. What about 5%? What's your reaction now? <laughs> and 45 minutes later they poured out for a mass meeting opposite the plant on what's known as Pork Chop Hill. Within the hour of the answer coming back from London, Haywood was emptied. After three weeks, Ford had lost over £20 million. 
just an average time. They abandoned government policy and sat down with the unions to negotiate. Whoever was nominally in charge, it was the activists in the so-called Ford Workers' Combine that helped set the pace. So we tell them in the name of the working class, you can stuff it right up your ass. After a nine-week strike, the unions finally accepted an offer of around 17%. The settlement not only drove a cortina through the government's pay policy, it also showed how powerless Labour had become without the support of the unions. In the end, the unions had to listen to their members. And the real problem with the unions was the activists, particularly in the shop steward movement, who were increasingly tending to take power away from the national union leaders. The Ford settlement burst the wage policy dam and the unions flooded in with demands for huge pay increases. In December, oil tanker drivers banned overtime in support of their demand for a 40% rise. Images of petrol queues and closed service stations filled the news reports. But what worried the government more was the threat to industry and essential services. At the Cabinet Office, they activated the Civil Contingencies Unit, or CCU, a body of ministers, civil servants and the military, which is called in times of national crisis. Troops were put on standby and trained to take over the tanker drivers' jobs. The plan was called Operation Drumstick, but before it could be put into effect, a national state of emergency would have to be declared. Calling a state of emergency divided the cabinet. Few were in favour, but all recognised that unless the dispute was resolved, they would have no other option. As Christmas approached, the energy secretary at the time, Tony Benn, called the union leaders in to discuss the crisis. Tony gave me a particular warning that in the event of there being a strike of the tanker drivers, then he would have to use troops. I, I was involved in those talks. There was principally two trade union leaders involved in that. And uh, I and my fellow ministers may have been responsible for giving the impression that if we couldn't get an agreement to deal with uh, important emergency services and keep cover on safe hospitals, for example, that uh, the cabinet would probably decide on a state of emergency. I don't think a state of emergency would have made very much difference to the dispute on the ground. I suppose it's the psychology that really mattered, that the government meant business, that the government wasn't going to be pushed around. Someone must have forgotten to pass on the message. The employers capitulated. A happy Christmas for the unions, but not the government. They avoided a state of emergency, but it was clear that as the tanker drivers settled for a 15% rise, it was union muscle that was running the show. The 5% pay limit was being ignored by almost everyone except the government. In the new year, as the winter weather worsened, the Prime Minister flew to the Caribbean for a sunny summit. Before coming home, the Prime Minister managed to grab a few days' holiday in Barbados. With striking lorry drivers making the headlines back home, it was a move that gave his spin doctors a headache. We got a message through uh, that there'd been a request for the Prime Minister to meet the press at Heathrow when he landed. What is your general approach and view uh, of the mounting um, chaos in the country at the moment? Well, that's a judgment that you are making, and uh, I promise you that if you look at it from outside, and perhaps you're taking a rather parochial view at the moment, I don't think that other people in the world would share the view that there is mounting chaos. I'm standing behind him during that interview, and I knew he was getting it wrong. It was one of those terrible things where you, you feel like you'd like to yank your man off and start again, but, but uh, uh, that, that was not to be. And, uh, of course, um, Walter Terry, um, in the sun the next day, encapsulated the mood, there's crisis, what crisis? <laughs>
and that hung around our neck for the, for the rest of the government. By the middle of January, the road haulage system was grinding to a halt. The country, already suffering from a particularly savage winter, now faced paralysis. Eighty percent of the nation's goods were transported by road, and the country faced the very real prospect of food shortages. To make matters worse, the drivers who were on strike began picketing firms where the drivers were still continuing to work. As supplies ran short, over a quarter of a million workers were laid off. As the dispute worsened, the cabinet were once again faced with the prospect of declaring a state of emergency and bringing the troops in. All around the country, soldiers were put on standby. The government was very, very close to bringing in the military, but in the end, Mr. Callan couldn't bring himself to do that. He'd spent his whole career working with the trade unions, and he once said to me, I've always worked with the unions, they've always supported me, and I could not bring myself at this final stage to turn against them and use the military against them. Len Murray and Moss Evans were summoned to Downing Street to discuss the crisis. The government, using the only weapon they had left, once again threatened to use troops if essential goods weren't moved. A major problem was animal feeds. Pigs and poultry in intensive farms require a carefully balanced diet. In Hull, food was getting through and animals weren't starving, but because of the dispute, they weren't getting the correct feed mix. To highlight what could happen to animals, farmers demonstrated outside the union headquarters. And they will start to die from starvation or deprivation from next Tuesday morning, unless we can get the food through. That is, that is the problem on the one side. The road haulage strike lasted for six weeks. Despite the government's continuing efforts to stick to 5%, the drivers went back with an extra 20% in their pay packets. But there were few winners long term on either side. When the tube's gone up and the bus is stopped Top folks still come out on top The government never resigned On January the 22nd, one and a half million public service employees staged a day of action in support of £60 minimum wage for the low paid. There was now no hiding place for the government because in this dispute they themselves were the employers. As schools were shut down and the railwaymen went on strike, their battered policy faced its ultimate test. Strikes by ambulance men and hospital ancillary staff soon meant that nearly half the country's hospitals could handle emergencies only. It wasn't just the government who were embarrassed, as volunteers had to be brought in to keep a rudimentary health service going. One or two of the Labour Ministers were historically very close to the trade unions and trade union leaders in their departmental areas. Uh, David Ennals at Health was an example of that. And I think they found it very difficult to resist the unions in their areas. And I remember at one cabinet committee, uh, Mr Ennals explaining why a 15% settlement was something of a triumph for the government. And I think I knew it was all over then. By the end of January, the public image of both government and union was in freefall. Up in Liverpool, even the gravediggers had gone on strike. The gravediggers were poorly paid and did have bad working conditions. Nevertheless, the press seized on this isolated case as a symptom of the madness that was infecting the whole country. As the coffins piled up, the city council were forced to store the bodies in a disused factory in Speak. 
the press hounds were now in full cry. As the dispute dragged on, yet again, the Civil Contingencies Unit were forced to consider alternatives. Gravediggers, to everyone's surprise, was the responsibility of the Department of the Environment, and the Secretary of State for the Environment was Peter Shaw at the time, who was attending some debate in the House, and came in rather late, brushing back his hair in that manner of his, and, uh, the, um, and Merlin Rees said to him, well, Peter, what do you think we can do about grave diggers? We really don't think that the Army should do that. And he said, oh dear, surely we could at least provide a skeleton service. The grave diggers went back to work with a 14% pay rise. It had only been a two-week strike, but it had a profound effect on the Prime Minister. But most damaging of all to the government's image was the strike by the refuse men. By the beginning of February, the rubbish was piling up, a disturbing symbol of the state to which the country had descended. We pulled every dirty trick in the book to, to get rid of Callaghan and Labour because uh, the unions were running riot, they were running the country uh, and causing mayhem. I mean, we could come out with big headlines, bury the dead, there were piles of rubbish in the streets because the dustmen were on strike, and we made it look as if this was general, universal and eternal. In fact, it was only fragmentary here and there, there was no great big problem. The labour movement was busy throwing itself on every sword or spear available. I mean, it, 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 was, it was an act of self-destruction which a hostile conservative media very effectively, uh, indeed brilliantly, recorded. The end of the government when it came was swift. Labour's majority depended on support by the Scottish nationalists. When a devolution referendum vote went the wrong way, they withdrew their support. An election became unavoidable. By the time of the general election on the 3rd of May, the strikes had petered out. But the damage, both to Labour and the power of the unions, was irretrievable. Here comes the Prime Ministerial Rover, bearing now Mrs Thatcher as Prime Minister. Suddenly, the trade union movement was given a power and an influence and a central position in our political life greater than at any time in its history, any time in its history. And in reality, when given that power and responsibility, they ran away from it. And beginning the process of being well and truly screwed by Mrs Thatcher. Uh, and it's difficult not to say, boy, didn't you deserve her.